Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show, I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about Riverdale, Season 7, Episode 13. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. So, the storm or whatever that Jughead was referencing last episode, I wasn't sure what it was going to manifest itself as. And, of course, it's going to manifest itself as, I guess, I guess this would be considered a Red Scare, but I was like, didn't a Red Scare happen in the 70s? I don't know if this would be kind of like the pre-Red Scare, and that was, because I was like, yeah, because obviously that was like a big conversation at the, I mean, but to be fair, maybe it was like a 30-long year, com maybe between like the 50s and the 80s was the big conversation of communist, communism, you know, the big, you know, the, the Red Scare. Maybe it just hit its zenith, like it, it, it crescendoed. Um, in the 80s, but, you know, maybe even back then, obviously, that being a thing. Wasn't expecting that to be what it is. And obviously, it's very poetic that um, Archie's teacher gives him the crucible, which is, you know, the whole story is built around, you know, it's based around the Salem witch trial and, you know, that paranoia and uh, pointing your fingers at anyone for different reasons. And I, I love that this episode tackles the very different, complex reasons why different people are doing it for different reasons. But... I mean, the first person to get the axe is their teacher, um, the one that Archie's been um, hanging around helping him with his poetry. And the sad thing is, Archie, you know, it's kind of afraid to kind of admit about, you know, be honest and open about his poetry because his uncle was like, right. I mean, you know, writing to a girl you're trying to get with is one thing. But I mean, you last thing you want is people thinking you're different, especially at a time where the witch hunt is going on about everything that it is, because it's about uh, communism is everything that's against traditional all American values and anything that's quote abnormal and outside of that, which means, you know, having non-American, uh, values as well as, which also includes not, you know, being gay. So there was that whole situation, but so his, his uncle's implying like, right. People might think something if you are someone that's all about words and stuff, but he's like, right. Archie can be multifaceted. You know, he can be someone that's very diligent with his words, but also be in the sports and also to be in the cars. Like, they're trying, I mean, in a time frame like this, everyone's supposed to fit, you know, not on your gender roles, but just like what life kind of like paints you in like the walls of like, this is who you're supposed to be. And so Archie's kind of in that tough spot. And so him reading um, a plant, his doing his line from the crucible, because I, I like to, I'll, t I'll talk about obviously Veronica's circumstances later, but I do love the parallels of like Archie's story of what he's doing and how it affects other people and Veronica's and especially about their performances because Archie like was gave like this boisterous and like powerful performance and Veronica gave this subtle kind of soft, powerful performance. And just, like, the juxtaposition between their performances and obviously what those respective plays of, like, oh, uh, something from King Lear and something from The Crucible and what those messages meant to everyone in the class and what it motivated them. Uh, we'll get to how that trickled out, but I think that's such a fascinating, like, dichotomy. Um, and it's just, like, like, like I said, those were just some, like, like, I think that was kind of a nice showcase of, uh, both of them as actors too. You know, it's like it's that layer, double layer to everything, kind of almost a meta layer to it. There's actually a lot of meta stuff in this episode. Like, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out there. There's that line from Cheryl where they were talking about my Miha of you know, um, Veronica's parents' show, and it's like she's like, yeah, I really liked the first season, but the show's been downhill since. And I was like. That has to be a nod at, like, probably people who feel like the way about Riverdale. I mean, probably there, there's quite a few shows I know a lot of people feel by the way. It's not like that's just a Riverdale thing. There's quite a few shows where, like, first season was fantastic. Every other season's been downhill. Hill since. Like, I would just say, like, there's quite a few. I'm not going to say any show because I'm not trying to put any show on blast, but I, I've heard that for a handful of shows. So it's just, but it felt like almost a meta commentary, like the show responding to how like some people feel about uh, Riverdale. So I think that I, I, I got that. There's also that meta line from Hermione at, uh, when, in her story where she was like, um, when it's all said and done, uh, seven years we've been doing uh, that show. We got to bow out and, you know, fit, cause I want to do, we want to do more. And it's like, that's, I'm sure that speaks volumes for like the actors and maybe the writers and some of the crew on this. I'm sure it probably reigns very true for that actors where it's like, right, you've played a character for so long. You want to, you want to 
you want to like you know uh, venture out more and kind of sink your teeth into something a little different, you know. So I, I just I love those meta elements to it. Um, uh, but circling back to Archie's circumstances, what I think is really interesting is that, um, well, especially because it's teacher, and I think it's going to be a big part of Archie's story because Archie's always been like the heroic character, and obviously we've seen really kind of like. I mean, over the course of the show, we've seen everyone else have their heroic moments as well. But I feel like Archie's poetry stuff is probably going to really become prolific and important, maybe before the end of this season. Um, I've, you know, it's already kind of touched people's heart when people are like, because he's still hiding it from other his friends, like that he's dead. Because it's like, no, she's helping me, and he pauses, and they're almost on, his friends are on bed at breakfast. And I'm like, what would she help me with? He's like. Yeah, she's just not a communist. Like, he still can't bring himself to admit it. Like, yeah, I'm, like, dedicating a lot of my time to my poetry because it means a lot to me. It's something he can pour his heart and his passion into. But I think that's going to be uh, a core element of his character. Like, that's going to come in handy in time, especially when she's like, right, be able to pr keep, keep going forward. And the fact, because it's like, oh, like, uh, she's like, yeah, you're, like, the Biff type, but you are... But you are so much more to that. And use your words. Words have power. You can use them for good. So obviously his performance for The Crucible had an effect. But also like his own words can have an effect on I think that's going to be a major through line for his story by the end or something like that. But um, what was kind of uh, an interesting development was Miss Grundy's The New Teacher. And I was like, interesting. I was like, are we still going to have... It's Miss Grundy, right? Because it's like... Uh, Geraldine Grundy. I was like, are, are you still going to be, you know, and let's not forget who she was. She's one of those teachers who has sex with her students. And you're like, so are you still? But then she was like, oh, I'm married. I was like, oh, okay, good. So she's not a predator in this timeline. But I'm like, well, I was like, that doesn't mean anything. I was like, just because, because I don't remember if Archie was her first in River. And, you know, uh, I know he definitely wasn't her last because before, because we, you know, because I think, I want to say the last time we saw her in the show was probably season two when Hal killed her. I want to say that's the last time. I don't think her characters made any other, like, oddball, like, uh, reappearances. Like, in, like, um, I don't think there was any flashback things or it, or I don't, I don't think she popped up in River Valley either. So I'm trying to remember, like, when was, I, I feel like Hal's killing her might have been the last time she popped up in the show. But we know at that time, because she was living in Greendale at the time after everything like being outed with the whole her and Archie relationship that she ended up still doing that even in Greendale. So, but now I'm like, that's why I was like, I can't remember if Archie was the first student of her she ever did that with, or was he not the first? He, once again, he was definitely not the last. So that's why I'm like, it could be a thing of she's never done it in this universe. And she, uh, Archie will end up becoming her first. Cause even though she's married, it still could be a thing of, Oh, something could come about that. But I would mean, it was like, oh, she's married, so nothing could happen. It's like, still possibly could happen. I'm interested to see what they do with that, because this is about kind of reworking a lot of, like, things. Um, and uh, so her character, like, you know, undoing a lot of terrible things that happened over the course of Riverdale, it could be a thing of, hey, uh, her character isn't the exact same person she was before. So maybe that could be something with a changer where she's not, the, once again, the predator that she was before. We'll ultimately have to wait and see what ends up happening. I don't know if they're going to throw a wrench into that, like with those circumstances. So I think she's going to be above board this time. We'll see. Um, but shifting over into everything with Cheryl, because her dad is bringing down this hammer on everything. And, He's doing it just to drum up enough fear because obviously he's doing everything he can to keep his mayorship. And it's like, right, having like, you know, and, and Veronica had told the story of like, yeah, like they're pointing at people, having people investigate it in um, Riverdale. I mean, uh, in Hollywood, just for the purposes of accusing people. Once again, kind of the crucible of it all, like maybe you have a personal vendetta against someone and you're just making a point, which plays into Cheryl's story because she got sold out by Evelyn because she saw an opportunity I was surprised Evelyn hadn't acted on it yet, but she took this opportunity to act upon it. So she put um, at least Cheryl and Tony. I don't know if she put Clay and Kevin on the list as well, but um, they might have already just been sus like suspected. People already kind of suspected them and threw them on the list, but Cheryl and Tony definitely was Evelyn's doing. And so... Obviously, Cheryl was not going to respond to her father and mother's threats, you know, because they're like, right, your proclivities. I, uh, but w I thought my I thought what was going to happen is what happened originally was her mother like 
shuttled her off to the Sisters of Quiet Mercy, but that's not what happened this time. It's like, right, we'll preserve your name, but you have to sell them out. But if you don't sell out everyone on the list, it's going to fall back on you. And Cheryl was willing to take that hit, but it's like, okay, we'll take away what's most precious to you, the Vixens. Because I think for her, outside of her family, the Vixens are something that she pours her heart, sweat, and tears. It's something she's passionate about. It is it is her, her thing. It is her baby is the thing that she cares about most, and her parents are going to take that away from her. But she wasn't willing to sell out Tony, Kevin, or um, Clay. So they came up with like, hey, let's pretend to be dating. Um, and that's how we get everyone off our backs. Which obviously comes a little full circle considering like, she was trying to deny her own feelings for Tony by dating Archie. So it just it feels like it all kind of came full circle there. But um, you saw, like, Midge in the hallway kind of looking at them because you know, like, well, Midge knows the truth about everything. So it's kind of like, oh, what's going on? And she probably figured, like, oh, what Cheryl was doing. So, well, she is part of the Vixens, too, isn't she? So I'm, I'm curious, like, how many of the Vixens will leave when it's all, you know, jumping ahead a little bit. I'm curious how many of them will leave under Evelyn's tutor. Like, she might not do a good, good enough job leading the Vixens. So, and some of them might also leave, especially, like, Midge. I could see her leaving in solidarity for, um... For Cheryl, but we'll have to wait and see. But um, but at the end of the day, especially after um, Archie's uh, King Lear performance and, you know, the whole thing about my name and, you know, I'm not worth kind of like even the the, the dust on the feet of the the people that have died so far. You know, the, the, the people that were hung and accused of being witches. And for Cheryl, it's like, right. Like, because she already knew, like, the whole pretending thing was going to hurt Tony so much because it's like right she's always been out and open and, and you know having to hide shoot who she is she's never been that type of person and Tony and but to protect all of them like Tony was willing to go along with it but Cheryl was like no you were going to take away the vixens I resign and you know so I'm gonna go hang out with Kevin and we'll double date with Tony and Clay but for Cheryl, she it, it hurts, but at the same time, she feels a sense of pride because that you know she was able to protect the people she's closest to. But also, it means that it's a place that she can continue just to be herself. It's like she found a a, a spark of freedom outside of like the Vixens and here amongst Clay, Tony, and Kevin of like right, we're able to kind of love who we want to love and be free, and you know so. We'll, we'll see how the whole Vixen situation plays out. Then we have the Veronica circumstances with her dad coming back to town, which I kind of got spoiled on that about like maybe a week or two. I, I got recommended an article referencing like he would be returning. to. Show. I was like, oh, I wish I didn't know that. But I thought that was kind of uh, pretty neat. But it's also like, right. He's like, oh, I'm just here to see my daughter. I'm like, why are you really here? He's like, yeah, me and your mom are kind of in a bit of hot spot. Like, Veronica knew there had to be more to it, and she even kind of figured it had to be like some stuff going on between them. But when it was all said and done, it's still that complicated thing of I'm happy to have you here because she's been away from her family ever since she showed up in Riverdale at the beginning of the season. So, well, quote unquote, beginning of the season, you, you know. So it's like, yeah, she, she, it felt good to have her family. Like, she wasn't as alone because at least everyone else around her has family. Kind of, sort of, obviously, Jughead being the exception to that. Having family in town, so for her, it felt good to have him in town again. And, oh, look at all that I've done and built for myself. But it turns out he's being investigated by the FBI, which, oh, God, I'm blanking on home dude's name. He was the FBI agent that worked with Betty, which I'm like, when the la I'm sorry, I remember, I was like, when was the last time we saw him? I was like, it was last season, right? Because I know he got murdered. By TBK, but I was on the say like, I think it was last season, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I was like, oh, for you to show up as the FBI agent, it's like hopefully you're not as much of a douche in this uh, this timeline. But he's the one that kind of presents to Veronica like, right, we have a reason for believing your father is a communist. He was in Cuba. He met with someone that was kind of like a freedom fighter of sorts, who's kind of against you know. Uh, wants to kind of take control of Cuba and then would uh, eventually come here and uh, fight against American values and stuff. But it turns out the reason why he was really there is he was having an affair with a woman named Kelly. And that's why he can't admit why he was really in Cuba, because it would mean it would go against the morality call. So he would lose everything. And so it's like, right, you don't, you're not... 
you're not asking because he ended up asking Veronica to lie and say like, hey, it was a father daughter vacation is why I was in Cuba. But now it's like, oh, the real reason why you're doing that. It's not because you're trying to protect our family. You're protecting yourself and your your lies and your deceit. You know, it's like, yeah, you might. Like, the fact is, because for Veronica, it's like here you are again choosing your career above me. It's like, right. Because he's like saying, like, right, if, if I lose all of this, if it gets exposed, we could lose everything. But for Veronica, it's like, I did lose everything. You sent me away from you guys alone with no friends. I had to leave behind the entire life that I knew, all the friends that I knew. I had nothing, and then I was able to build something from that. I found a home here. I found friends here. I built a business for myself. I was able to, like, scrounge out from, like, like having lost everything I'd lost before. But you, Dad... Will you be able to do the same? And it's like, I don't think he would. It's so interesting. It's the sad thing that no matter what circumstances, Veronica and her pa parents, specifically, like her and her mom had their complications, but obviously her her complicated relationship was mainly her and her dad. So it's like, no matter wh what time frame it may be, they always end up having a very cantankerous relationship, you know? And so because of the, the king, I mean, for, because of the crucible and her own performance in the... Uh, King Lear uh, uh, piece that she did she finally comes to a decision that she decides to help her dad but she it comes with conditions you have to tell mom the truth about what you did and also you have to hold the like give the Pembroke back to me because I want to be able to guarantee that I have a home to return to even if it's not with you or so and those are the concessions and he accepted it and I think that cuts even deeper that you are like the fact is you were even willing to ask your daughter in the first place that you're willing to accept these concessions because it means about protecting yourself so it's like right I'm gonna do what I need to you know and so Hermione showed up like after Hiram and left and it turns out like right we're gonna keep it and we're not gonna let the world know we're just gonna be like hey we're gonna end the show and go our separate ways type of thing well they're gonna let that be known after the fact but yeah, she's going to get divorced from um, Hiram and, uh, you know, kind of start fresh. And it all kind of comes full circle because, well, after Hiram got kicked out of town, um, well, yeah, I'd say like after Hiram got kicked out of town and everything, well, I guess that was even, even, even before that, um, Arch, the, 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 Veronica and her mom already kind of had their relationship kind of outside of everything with her and Hiram. But I think even post his death, that still kind of ended up being applicable. But like it, the series started with him in prison and them coming to Riverdale together. So it's like maybe this situation will lead to her and her mom being together. But it's like her mom's like, oh, like let's kind of vacation back in New York together i don't know if that's like a permanent thing of like let's move to new york together after when it's all said and done so kind of having to leave riverdale behind i don't know if that's what that's kind of implying or is it just gonna be like oh just for vacation stuff we'll go to new york feels like that might be a permanent thing because now veronica's probably gonna be like do i need to kind of sacrifice the new life i've been building here just to go be with my mom in new york because she's gonna need me after everything between her and my dad goes sideways She'll probably still always love her dad, but like it's like the original timeline and everything, it's, that relationship is always going to be very complicated and cantankerous. So, well, it'll be interesting to see where things kind of go on that front and if that's kind of set up for what uh, Veronica's story ends up potentially being and how it kind of wraps up in, 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 in some capacities. Uh, we also have Betty's circumstances, which her mom took her phone and uh, the phone out of her room and like her typewriter just to kind of make a point of just... It's like, I, I guess it's like we we want we want to have a better control and monitor, monitoring of what you do and um, what you're a part of because of everything that's going on. So this definitely feels like a prime like red scare type of stuff. Feels like something like Alice could really like like really lean into. Like you could definitely see her being kind of a. Well, I think I know the reason why uh, she wasn't in this episode is because well, Machinomic. Uh, I always butcher her name, and I feel so bad about it. I hope I'm getting it right, but I'm pretty sure I'm butchering it. It's, she directed this episode, so, you know, typically in those situations, it's like the actor's not in the episode much, or at the very least, they might not be... At the very least, they're in it a little bit, or they're not in it at all. So, but this felt like... But even if she's not in this episode, it could definitely feel like a... Um, Alice could definitely, like, thrive in, in, under these circumstances, because she's definitely... the 
finger pointing type and just could really revel in this time period, a uh, time frame with uh, the you know uh, fear of communism and all that. But I, I think that's almost interesting too because having Machin Amic direct this episode, it almost feels like, like I said, because this feels like a point that Alice, especially this version of Alice, could really thrive in, it feels interesting for her to be the one to direct this this particular episode. It's like, right, she kind of like, she all, all she has to do is implant some Alice feeling vibe to this episode in that capacity, and that really nails that paranoia pointing fingers type of thing. It's also interesting timing too, just because it's like, well... What also drops on Wednesday, Secret Invasion, which is all about finger pointing of who can you trust, who can you believe. So it's how serendipitous. Obviously, that's in a more fun, suspicious, spy thriller type of way. And this is the more like, man, humans suck and we can turn on each other in the flip of uh, in, a, in a dime. Like I said, it, it doesn't always have to be like a, yes, there's fear mongering element to it. But it's also, there are people like an Evelyn and there are people like this in the Crucible and just the Salem Witch Hunt trials in general. Where it's like, hey, here's some people I don't like. This is my opportunity to get rid of you. That's an, another thing I want to quickly divert back to because I was thinking, I was like, I, I knew there was something else I wanted to talk about the Cheryl situation, but I couldn't remember. It's like, Cheryl's like, when did you start hating me? Evelyn's like, oh, since the beginning. I was like, why? I guess because it's like, without you around, the only reason, probably like, only reason why you got what you got is because of your family. I would have led the Vixens because of my actual uh, skill and merit. So maybe that's why she's always had issues with Cheryl, or maybe it's just a, oh, always thinking you're better than me type of thing, so maybe that's kind of part of the animosity there, too, but for her to be straight up like, no, I've always hated you, and it's like, we never got a rhyme or reason for it, and just, I guess she doesn't really need one, but, or maybe there is some truth to my thoughts of, like, yeah, and just jealousy and just envy, and also just, like, she thinks you look down on her thinking, like, oh, you're better than me, but I'm better than you, and once again, I owned every, I earned everything, whereas your family had to kind of give you everything, so and those could be enough reasons on their own, so. But, either way, I kind of went on that massive tangent. Circling back to Betty, Betty ended up losing the blue and gold because their teacher that they lost is also the same one who was um, the teacher in charge of the blue and gold. And it's like, oh, you don't really uh, do any hard-hitting journalism. And Betty's like, you son of a bitch, like, I try to, but every time we've ever tried to, you shut down every story. You, you know, it's like, oh, oh well. And maybe you'll be able to contribute something meaningful to society or whatever at one point in time. But that time is not now. It's like, ah, uh, once again, you son of a bitch. But Betty wasn't going to take that lying down, so she started a secret uh, kind of news letter of sorts of her own, and she's keeping it anonymous. Um, and she, uh, ends up picking up her mail at the end of the episode and like everyone wrote to her. It's like, right. Let me, you can anonymously send in like whatever you're thinking, whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're feeling, because we've all going through this wild experience that is teenage being a teenager. So, you know, Alice is going to find out about that and kind of, exp that's going to be an issue, I'm sure. But I don't know. Hopefully, Alice would read some of what Betty's writing about and maybe it'll strike a chord and make Alice kind of snap out of like her delusional state that she's in right now. Especially considering like there's the stuff between her and Hal that we haven't really, really dived into yet. We've kind of scratched the surface, but we haven't really gone beyond that at this point. So that's going to be interesting to see what happens on that front. Then we also have the situation with Jughead and Ethel, which, hey, we're excited. We finally got our comic book out there, but no one's selling it because of this whole thing of, like, because comic books are continue to be demonized. And so Pep Comics in general, it's not even just their comic and potential, because Pep Comic really leans into, like, some horror stuff. It's like they're kind of getting the rough end, but it's comic books in general kind of being considered, hey, they rot your brain, they corrupt the youth, so... Jughead and Ethel ended up selling some copies, and as they were doing their thing, I was like, oh, "We're gonna find out." Like the la the last person being who they were, I dressed up the way they were. I was like, "You're you're you're um you're an undercover, aren't you?" And he kind of was. He was a plant, but like it was a Boy Scout or whatever, because I guess other people had been buying up the comics from the Scouts, and he was sent in to kind of bust up the scene. So they were the rest of their comments were taken from them, but they still made a pretty penny, especially in this time frame from it. Plus, Ethel was able to get her work out there and it you know, it's proud to be kind of a established and published uh, uh comic book artist. So, you know, it, it was pretty dope. It was pretty nice, you know. 
Uh, but although that happiness and everything was immediately cut short because the principal and um, Weatherby had their plans. And so with Keller, they are planning like, right, the only way we're going to be able to strike this back is we're going to have to go full measure. And I was like, what's that imply? And so when they want to buy all the comics at the end, I was like, what are they planning? I don't get that. It's also sucks because obviously a lot of those comics will probably be super rare one day and be worth a lot more. But obviously, it's like, oh, we're getting a pretty penny for them now, so that's that. Oh, it's because they were literally going to create a bonfire and burn all the comics. Which is obviously true to the world. Like, there have been points in history where people have burned books that, you know, people don't generally agree with. It's like, that's that's also that complicated thing. Like, I mean, books that got burnt. That's the common, because I know there are some books out there that have very hateful rhetoric they're meant to be hateful so that's where i'm like i don't i don't know about like i mean burning my comp seems perfectly fine but then i, I think for some people the argument is like that's a slippery slope because yes there's very hateful books out there that you don't have to agree with but it's like keep those out there because you want them to exist so you can like dispute them but also it's like yeah but when you like give a platform for something like i that's where that kind of comes into a because like i said there's books that like a like a mind comp can literally burn be destroyed versus other things being kind of put almost on that same level despite not being and so in this case it ended up being comic books but it's like yeah it will go to other literature that is considered unsavory as well um which is so interesting considering whether be read a book that's unsavory that uh, Betty busted him for, so that's a whole thing. Um, but it's also a little poetic, not poetic, but also still timely because that's still an, an, a conversation that's happening recently. Because obviously, there are books that end up get. it's not the exact same thing, but it's still in that wheelhouse of like, yes, there are books that get banned because of the time frame they were written in. Like, that's I, th I think it's a it's a situation where I can see both sides of the argument with like you know some of the Cat in the Hat book uh, the Doctor Seuss books not specifically Cat in the Hat some of the Doctor Seuss books uh, because there's a lot of racist imagery in some of those um, that has kind of led to them getting banned and that's that's been a, a a conversation there are books and even movies that are being re edited for modern day because it's like oh the but it's like those are the type of situations where I was like, they those should stay the same because they are time capsules. So a recent example, I was watching a video, I think on Just Kidding News. I don't remember. I don't know how recent this is or, you know, just because obviously they blocked those videos out like for long periods of time before they can end up coming out. So it could have been months ago that article dropped or maybe weeks or a couple of days, whatever the case may be, where they were talking about some of the James Bond books are being rewritten. They kind of fit more modern time, but like, like I was just saying, like those books are time capsules. Like I'm not saying like oh they don't they are written in a very specific time period, and I think it's important to keep those things around of like remembering where we came from because it's also a beautiful representation of like well we don't believe that anymore. I get you want to edit it to be like well we don't agree with that. It's like keep it there as a reminder that we don't think that way anymore. That 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 this book was written in a very specific time and a specific point in history. It is like a it is being kind of an authentic authenticness to the way it was written. In some of those cases, it's like, yes, yeah, something that doesn't change the story doesn't matter. But I think it is I think it is just kind of an important growth of showing like, right, we don't agree with the way this was written and then some of the words used, but that's just kind of proof of like, right, that's history and we are not those same people. That book wouldn't be written that way today, like type of situation. So I, I kind of put it all in that same wheelhouse. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's not exactly the same, but I do think it's still kind of within the same wheelhouse and ballpark. So a lot of really, really interesting developments on that front. And obviously because of that, you know, that's going to be probably like, I guess, the one of the big, big things, elements to this story going forward, especially for these uh, last episodes of the show. I mean, we are down to the wire. It's only, what, seven episodes left now? Yes, so we'll ultimately have to wait to see where the next episode ultimately ends up taking us going forward with all of this. But really, that's all I wanted to talk about. Until the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day, and... Good.